everyone. Thank you so much for coming today to our financial aid webinar on how to file your FAFSA. I just want to say a big thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to join me today. First off, I know right now for every family, this is a very busy time, and especially for parents and their seniors who are trying to wrap up a senior year during a pandemic, I can't even imagine. So I know your time is precious, and I promise to make this webinar informative and worth your time. My name is Carrie Nash, and I am the Assistant Director of Financial Aid here at the University of Lynchburg. And I have been working in higher education, specifically in financial aid, for the past 10 years. That means that I've seen a lot of families go through this process, and I've seen a lot of families go through the anxiety that can accompany this process. So even though I get, a, I get to help a lot of families file their FAFSA, I know a lot of times they come with a lot of anxious ideas or a lot of panic before they even start the process. So what I'm hoping to do today is just give you some information to help better equip you so that you know not just how to file your FAFSA, but maybe how to file your FAFSA without feeling like you're completely lost. So for today's webinar, our format is going to be 45 minutes of presentation, and we're going to take the last 10 to 15 minutes for questions. There will be a chat box available for you if you are attending today's webinar. So please feel free to utilize that chat box to put in any questions that you have. And then I'll go over them at the very end of the presentation. So for today's webinar, there will be three main topics that I wanna cover. First of all, I wanna go through the FAFSA step-by-step. Step. Some of you may not have ever filed a FAFSA before, so this is going to get you acquainted with what it looks like and what you can expect. If you've done a FAFSA before, then this, is, this will just be a recap for you since you may already be familiar with the process. But it may also jog your memory on a few things that I would like to cover in our second topic, which is mistakes that we commonly make on the FAFSA. So my second topic with you today will be what those common mistakes are and how to correct them. And then the third topic I wanna to cover with you today is, okay, so I completed my FAFSA, I've corrected my mistakes, now what do I do? I'll also cover what the Department of Education does with that information once your application has been submitted, what your school does with that information once they receive it, and then what your final steps will be as a student getting ready to attend your freshman year. So let's go ahead and jump right in. So again, filing the FAFSA, I want to take you through the step-by-step -step process, how to log in, what information you'll need, and how to tackle your taxes. So as we know with any journey, it is important to come prepared. I don't know about you, but when I'm getting ready to travel somewhere, I like to plan ahead. I look at the weather, I pack for the climate, I find that fun things to do, et cetera, et cetera. And with trips that you take, it's also important to come prepared to complete your FAFSA. If we are going to have a good journey and not get lost through this process, then we need to know what we need to pack. So first of all, your students are going to need to gather some information before they can even begin the process. The student will need to create what is called an FSA ID, and I'll talk about this a little bit more in detail in some following slides. You will also need your student's legal name, their date of birth, and their social security number to make sure that they have all their identifying information. It's also a good idea for your student to have a list of schools that they wanna send their FAFSA to. I've seen a lot of students get on the computer to complete their FAFSA with the general idea of what they wanna do on their FAFSA, but then we're, we're there, we're in the moment, and we got the parents, we got the guidance counselors, and you got me standing over your shoulder watching you make this important decision. And I don't know about you, but that would absolutely stress me out. So it's a good idea to have at least of the schools, a list of the schools that you wish to send your FAFSA information to, and if possible, to find their school code ahead of time. School codes will be listed, well, they're usually listed on the financial aid website of each school. Finally, if your student did complete taxes within the last two years, you'll want to have that tax information and their W-2s from two years prior. 
So now that we've got the student's information, you as the parent will also need to bring information which is very similar to what your student needs. Each parent will have their own FSA ID and password. Luckily, you don't have to make an FSA ID for both parents, even if both parents' information will be on the application. Only one parent has to sign the application, so only one parent needs an ID, but it doesn't hurt to have two. If parents want to create an ID and password, then this is highly recommended, but it is not required. You will also need the names, date of birth, and social security number for any parent that will be on the application. Also, parents, you will need to bring your tax information and W-2s from two years prior. You can bring all of this with you, then you will be set up to complete it, complete your FAFSA application more successfully and in a timely manner. So now that we have all of our basic information gathered, we are ready to start the application. The first thing that you are going to need to do is create that FSA ID and password. The FSA ID is a unique ID and password, and it allows you to log in, and it serves as a way to sign documents from the Department of Education. Documents such as your FAFSA, um, when you need to complete your loan agreements and repayment schedules. It's a really important tool and it is the foundation for you getting your FAFSA submitted. There's one ID for the student and then there's one ID for the parent. As I mentioned earlier, you really only need one ID for your parent because only one parent is going to sign the application. So then you can decide which parent will help the student fill out their FAFSA and sign it. Make sure that there is an FSA ID made for them and an FSA ID made for the student. This FSA ID is going to be linked to your social security number, which means that it is, it is a unique identifier. If you create one this year and the next year you realize that you have forgotten all of that information and you need to reset a password, you won't be able to create an entirely new FSA ID. So I highly recommend linking either a cell phone number or an email address some way that you can easily retrieve and reset a password because you won't be able just to create a new one from scratch. It's really easy to forget your FSA ID and password because you only use it once a year. And I don't know about you, but it's hard for me to remember a password from week to week, much less 365 days in between. If you create an FSA ID before you complete your FAFSA, it will save you a lot of time. I'm not going to say that it's my favorite students that do this, but I am going to say that if you're able to create your password and ID for you and your parents ahead of time, it allows us to give more time to you to go over details of your FAFSA that probably are gonna weigh heavily on the actual determination of getting your financial aid. So please, if you can do this, try to create your ID for yourself and for your parent ahead of time. Sometimes the vetting process confirming your ID and password can take can take a while and take up to 24 hours. So to avoid any delays, do this before you actually start the process. Now, once you've actually have your IDs made, it is now time to log into the website, which I've listed here for your convenience. Make sure you plug in .gov and not .com. If you make it to the .com website, it will look very similar but the only difference is it will make you pay money to process your FAFSA. So if you've landed here, you've gone way too far, go back. So from here, you're gonna have two options right away when you first log into your FAFSA. I'll pull up the screen here in a minute so you can see, but there will be an option that says start here if you're a new user or a login if you are a returning user. A new user is someone that never completed a FAFSA or started a FAFSA before. A returning user is someone that has either submitted a FAFSA before or has at least started one. I would stress the importance of having the student complete this process with their parents nearby. Once you're logged in, it will start to ask questions that includes pronouns like you and yours. And if a parent is completing the application on behalf of the student, then chances are the parent may think the question is referring to them and not the student. However, it is not uncommon for the parent to complete this application. So if you decide to do this, please make sure you're plugging in the right information. And we'll talk about this a little bit later. 
So as again, here is your logging into your FAFSA web page. So again, you can start here if you are a new user or if you're a returning user who maybe needs to do a renewal application or maybe start over, uh, you had to leave and then come back, you'll click the returning user login button. So the landing page is basically allowing you to select what you wanna do and what journey you wanna go on. For this FAFSA, it will allow you to choose from multiple years. Make sure you select the correct age year you wish to apply for. If you are unsure, contact your financial aid office and they will certainly give you that information. If you submitted a FAFSA previously, you're gonna have the option to make corrections to an already processed FAFSA. This all happens on this landing page. This is an example of what the pan landing page looks like. As you can see from the picture, you've got multiple age years available. Most students who plan to begin in August of 21, you will want to select the 21-22 FAFSA option. The next thing the FAFSA is going to do is actually let you start entering information. It's going to ask you for a save key. The save key is not the same thing as your ID and password. It is yet another thing you have to remember, but it is going to be a little bit different. It's just a temporary password that acts like a bookmark. So if for any reason during the FAFSA, you need to log out and come back later, it's going to ask you for your save key. Once the save key has been entered, it will allow you to pick up right where you left off with all of the information still saved as you put it in the very first time. Again, this is a temporary password. So I usually tell people not to stress about it too much. Pick something easy and simple that you're going to remember in the future. So for me, I keep it very simple. I do one, two, three, four, because let's be honest, it's as easy as it gets and it's a no brainer. Um, I sometimes will tell students to use the last four of their social, um, maybe date of birth, just something that's easy to remember that you may not have to write down. Just, just pick something that's easy in case you need to come back into your application at a later time. So we've gotten through the landing page. The very first thing your FAFSA is going to ask you about is the student's personal information. This is where their full name, their date of birth, and their is all going to be pre-filled since this information is attached to their ID and password that they used to sign in with. If you see the information that's pre-filled, the FAFSA does its best to be accurate but you want to make sure that if you can correct something, you do it before it is submitted. The FAFSA is going to check on the student demographic information for some basic eligibility requirements. This is where it will give you the opportunity to register for the selective service if you are a male. It will also ask you for citizenship information to confirm that you are a U.S. citizen or eligible non-citizen. Now, I will say that this is my first tip when you're going through the FAFSA because it uses pronouns a little loosely, as I mentioned before. It will use you and yours. So who is actually filling out the FAFSA? It's always a good idea to check up at the top of the page. It's going to be asking you questions that you might think are a little strange. One of the student questions asks, are you married? Well, if a parent is filling out that their, their child's FAFSA, they may look at this question and say, well, yes, I as the parent am married, but in all actuality, the FAFSA is asking you about your student. So it's a good tip whenever you get to a page to look at the very top of that page. There's a little blue banner that, will, that you can check at the top of your screen and it says whether it's asking for student information or parent information. So when you see that banner, you know all of the questions on that page will pertain to either the student or parent. And you will notice that it will switch back and forth throughout the FAFSA. So as it switches, that banner will also change. So just make sure you are double checking what the banner says at the top as you're plugging in the information. All right, so now we've gotten to the school selection. Here is where your list of school codes will come in handy. If you found them ahead of time, hopefully you'll be able to breeze through this um, part of your application rather quickly. Again, it will allow you to add up to 10 schools. 
Don't worry if you are looking at 11 schools, if you're looking at 20 schools, it will allow you to add those, but only 10 at a time. So my recommendation would be to add these 10 schools, submit your application, and then once that submission has been processed, you can go back in and delete schools and add more schools to your application and submit. So it'll allow you to keep doing that as you progress. So here is what the school selection page will look like. It will allow you to locate schools through either a school code or you can actually type in the name of the school. So once you're done and you have the school, you'll select this blue checkbox and that will let FAFSA know, yes, the school I want to add to my application. Then you can add more schools if you wish to do so. And then when you're done, you'll hit the next button, which is right beside the add more schools button. And that will take you to the next screen, which is the dependency status page. So the dependency the dependency status page is probably one of the first pages where I see families start to struggle. They don't know what they're supposed to do. The Department of Education has some very specific requirements that a student has to meet in order to be considered independent, which means they do not have to include parent information on their application. And it may not always be the criteria that you would think of. Some examples are a student being over the age of 24, a student being married, a student having children of their own, or dependents that they support, or they may be on active duty, or they're a veteran. If you answer yes to any of these questions, then the Department of Education will say, okay, we actually don't need parent information. Things that the Department of Education does not include as independent status would be if a student is living on their own and doesn't meet any of the other criteria. So if they're filing taxes on their own separate from the parents, this does not constitute an independent student, even if the student is supporting themselves more than half of the time. So keep in mind, even if you think, well, I moved out of the house, I'm supporting myself. If you don't meet any, any of the other criteria, like being over the age of 24 or being in a graduate program, you're probably still going to have to add your parents' information to the FAFSA and that is normal. Now, for some of you, you may not have contact with your parents or some, or some kind of extenuating circumstance that prevents you from including them on your application. Again, that is okay. Answer the questions the best you can, submit your FAFSA, then reach out to your school's financial aid office to inquire about a dependency appeal. They will be able to guide you through this process. So the application is pretty smart and can actually determine some of the answers based on the information you've already supplied. If the box is grayed out, then that means you cannot change the information. When we discuss number in college, I want you to keep in mind that this is a very important step. If another person in the household, excluding your parents, are enrolled in college, make sure you include them in this figure. By doing so, the Department of Education will take into account all the financial aid information that you are supplying and then recognize that household income needs to be divided between more than just one student in school. As you can see, not every box on here is grayed out. For example, the number in college is not grayed out, it's white. You can edit this field, but you cannot edit anything that is grayed out. You'll have to go and find the corresponding question on a previous page. If you get stuck, contact either the Department of Education or your financial aid office and they will be able to help you. Once you've already entered the student demographic information, it is now time that's going to start asking you questions about your parents. And it's not surprising that this is the second place where most of my families will get stuck. Parent demographics are going to be very similar to the student's information as far as personal information goes, but it's going to have a focus on the marital status. The FAFSA wants to know who makes up your household, not necessarily who your biological parents are. So I see a lot of families struggle with this because they say, well, my parents are actually divorced and my parent that I live with is now remarried. Who, who do I put on the FAFSA? Do I put my bi biological parents? 
or do I put my biological parent and my step parent? A good rule of thumb is to remember that the FAFSA does not want to know who your biological family is. They want to know what parents support you most of the time and who else is included in that household. That means if you live with one parent primarily 51% or more of the time and that parent is remarried, you will include your step parent on your FAFSA even though they may not be a biological parent. Once again, it's gonna switch back and forth between student information and parent information pretty frequently. Here, you're gonna see a lot of switches in the upcoming slides. If you're not quite sure what page, what the page is asking you, make sure you refer to the blue banner up at the top of your screen. In this case, you can see that this is the first parent information tab that we've come to. So it's not asking questions about the student anymore. It is now switched over to the parent. Always check that blue banner in, in order to avoid making any wrong questions. Once you've actually entered all of the demographic information, the FAFSA is going to need to know what your family's available resources are. It's going to use federal tax information in order to help figure this out. And I see a lot of families get nervous about this because they're not sure why FAFSA is asking for this information. And they may be afraid that they're going to mess it up. And that is understandable. Someone who works with numbers constantly I always get nervous when I have to plug in things manually. The only reason FAFSA is asking for tax information is because it's a verifiable information that helps them determine what resources are available to your family, just as a starting point. So in, in order to help avoid making mistakes, we always recommend that you use your tools. If you have the option to use the IRS data retrieval tool, definitely do so. We highly recommend you use this because it's actually going to allow you to transfer over your information securely from the IRS into your FAFSA application, which will alleviate you having to worry about accidentally omitting a zero, adding a zero, or maybe switching numbers accidentally. If it's offered, please use this tool. It is, it is a great option. <laughs> Now, with that being said, not every family is going to be able to use this tool. Some filing statuses are actually, they won't qualify for this. If you file a foreign tax return, for example, the IRS doesn't have that information. So you can't use that tool and that's okay. You can put in the information manually. If you can't use this tool, you will just have to look through your FAFSA and every question will actually have a corresponding line to your 1040 form. Now, each question also has a little blue question mark beside of it. These question marks will appear all over the FAFSA and they are there for your benefit. They will be your best friend. If you get lost, you can click on those blue question marks and it will actually take you to a page and will give you detailed information about what the question is asking. And almost every question on the FAFSA has these. They become a lifesaver when you're actually trying to fill in things manually so definitely utilize them. Now, if you, don't, if you do have the option of using the IRS data retrieval tool, you're going to need to follow the links to actually get you to the IRS website. So once you put in your parents' basic tax information, you can see here on the screen, this little blue box will pop up at the bottom that says link to the IRS. You'll have to click that blue box and it's gonna warn you that it's gonna take you away from the site, but it'll, it'll, it, will, it will actually confirm it a few times, but it's just for your security purposes. Once you actually get to the IRS website, you're going to have to use your parents' FSA ID and password to log in, and then you'll enter the filing status and the address you used on that tax year that you're trying to receive. The address has to be identical to the address that's on that particular tax return or else it won't work. Once you actually enter in your information, you're, you will still have to confirm that you want to transfer it. So don't close out of any tabs. It will auto directly, it will auto direct you back to your FAFSA once, once you're done. And it usually takes about a minute or so to make sure that you've actually done this. So until you get to the page that says, okay, 
transfer my tax information into my application, you're not 100% finished yet. So you've clicked the blue box and then you click the blue button that says transfer now. After that happens, there's gonna be a bunch of answers that will pre-fill onto your FAFSA application. It will suddenly pre-fill, so you're not able to edit them, but um, this is actually okay. And you'll probably see that a lot of your responses are hidden from sight. This is just a security feature, so it's completely normal. If you start going through your tax information session section and you notice a lot of things are just labeled transferred from IRS, that's normal. And it means that it's successfully transferred over. All right, so we've transferred my tax information into my application. You've clicked the blue box and then you've clicked the blue box that says transfer now. This is, will just let you know exactly what you're doing and what you're looking for. Even if you use the IRS data retrieval tool, there will still be some information that the IRS cannot transfer for you, and you will have to enter that information manually. This is going to be questions about untaxed income, additional income assets that your parents own, and will ask you to separate your parents' wages. So make sure you read every question carefully. I think a lot of times we look at math related questions and our brain just kind of jumps ahead and assumes we know what it's going to be asking. So take a deep breath, read the question twice, and then if you're still not sure what it's asking, click the blue question mark at the end of the line. And then it will provide more information about what it really is asking for. This will definitely help you avoid a lot of problems and questions. Now, once you've gotten to the additional information section, you're going to see that the blue banner at the top of the screen on the next page switches back to student. Surprisingly, this is where I see a lot of families goof up on, on the application. They've kind of already gotten through the parents' information, they hit next, and then all of a sudden, the page looks identical to what they just completed. They don't recognize that it has switched from parent to student. When this happens, we receive FAFSAs that say a student's filing mar that a student has filed married married filing jointly. Uh, they've made over two hundred thousand dollars in adjusted gross income. So make sure that you're not mistakenly filling out the student information se section with parent information. Always check at the top of that page to make sure you know who you're answering for. In this case, if the student did file taxes, they're going to have the IRS data retrieval tool option as well. And it's going to be the exact same process as their parent used just previously. And if the student didn't file taxes, then they're just gonna put down that they did not file taxes and then only answer questions about their wages if they worked. Um, they will also include information about their assets that they own and maybe additional income that wasn't accounted for. So kind of towards the end of your application, you will get to this question that says, are you a preparer? Your answer to this is no. Even if I were to actually be there with you, I am also not a preparer. A preparer is someone who will expect money for their services. So for this particular question, you will say no, you are not a preparer. At the very end of the FAFSA, it will give you the option to double check everything to ensure you're happy with the responses you provided. It will give you a list of all of the questions it just asked along with their corresponding answers. Make sure you read through them carefully, and if something does not look correct, go ahead and fix it. If you cannot fix it for any reason, go ahead and submit anyways, and we can always correct it down the road. So after you've double checked everything, the next page is actually going to be where you wanna sign and submit. You can go ahead and hit next, and it's gonna take you to the signature page. Once you've successfully signed and submitted your application, you will receive a confirmation page confirming that your application has been submitted. Do not stop or close out of any tabs until you have received this confirmation. The confirmation is the only surefire way to know that your application has indeed been submitted. Now, once you've received this confirmation, print out that page for your records, and then I want you to go ahead and celebrate. 
chances are you've been stressed this whole time and deserve a little bit of a celebration. So now that we've done our step-by-step -step process through the FAFSA, now I want to kind of provide what um, some of the, the most commonly um, most common FAFSA errors are. Um, well, that, that I see as a financial aid administrator. And then I also want to show you how to avoid them. So believe it or not, the number one mistake I typically see is incorrect personal information, such as your legal name or social security number. So for example, my name is Carrie Ann Nicole Nash. That is the name that is printed on my social security card. It is not the name I go by. So if I were to put Carrie Nicole Nash on my FAFSA, chances are I will come back saying that my name is wrong and it will ask me to change it before the application can be processed. Another common error is plugging in maybe a four instead of a five for your social security number, date of birth. With mistakes like this, just remember that when you are plugging in information into your FAFSA, just make sure you are hitting keys slowly and double checking your answers as you go. The last common thing that I see as far as personal information goes is typically an incorrect tax filing status. I see a lot of people either not sure of what their tax filing status is, or maybe they just accidentally click the wrong thing and it puts them into a category that is not eligible for the data retrieval tool. So if this happens, just make sure you go back and choose the option that is available to you and then plug in the correct information. Again, if you need to submit and come back later, that is always an option, but being able to use the data retrieval tool saves you a lot of time and is quite effortless. The next thing that I usually see families do is over-reporting, and I think that this is a result of nerves and just the sheer fact that most people want to be honest on this application and you wanna be as accurate as possible. For questions like these, pension, child support received, net, net worth of investments, go ahead and use that blue question mark that we talked about earlier. It will provide you with information that needs to be reported and things you can exclude. I see a lot of families who report the value of their own home under the net worth of investments, which will actually drive up their expected family contribution. And then they wonder why they're not receiving more financial assistance. While we love for you to be honest, there are just some things that you can exclude. Along that same line, the last thing I see is a lot of students and their families doing an under-reporting. They say, okay, well, I'm just gonna skip that question because I don't wanna admit that I have this certain thing to report because maybe I'm going to over-report it. Unfortunately, you, that, that can hurt you um, in things like education credits, combat pay, child support that you have to pay. Those are actually things that are good for your expected family contribution. It can actually help lower that number and cause you to be eligible for more need-based aid. So while over-reporting is something that can hurt you, under-reporting can also hurt you. The best thing to do, like I said earlier, just take a deep breath, read the answer, I'm sorry, read the question twice, and then check that blue question mark if you still have any hesitation. That blue question mark will let you know what to do, and if you're still unsure, go ahead and contact your financial aid office. This is what we do, and we're here to help get you through this process as accurately as possible so that you don't have to worry um, whether or not you're doing it incorrectly. All right, so you've submitted your FAFSA and you realize immediately, or maybe not so immediately, maybe further down the road, that you've made a mistake and you need to correct something. This is completely doable. However, you must wait until your application is processed, which usually takes about one to three days. Once your waiting period is over, you can log back into your FAFSA using the returning user option, plug in your FSA ID and password, and then hit make corrections. Again, make sure that you have made it to that confirmation page at the end so you, you know that your corrections have been successfully submitted. So now that we have gone through and we filed your FAFSA step-by-step, step, we've gone through common mistakes, 
and how to try and avoid them, but also how to fix them. So now I wanna to talk to you uh, briefly about what happens next. You submitted your FAFSA and now you're just twiddling your thumbs waiting for something to happen. I just wanna give you some reasonable excellent expectations about what is coming with your information and what you should be looking to do next. So now that you have submitted it, what will the Department of Education be doing? They will actually be reviewing your information and confirming all of the information within your application. They will send you what is called um, a SAR, a student aid report. This will be sent to you electronically. Um, you will be inserting your email address into your application. So this is the email address it will be sending this SAR to. Make sure you're looking that information over and if anything needs to be corrected, you can do it right there on that student aid report. It will also allow you to go back into your FAFSA application and make the corrections needed on your application itself. Now, once the University of Lynchburg has received, what do we do? So once your application is received, we will begin processing it and putting it together we will develop what is called a financial aid package based on that information. We will also send that information out to you electronically, so make sure that you are monitoring your student email. If any additional information is needed, we will certainly be reaching out to you. Now, what are some things that you need to do as a student? make sure you are checking your email and your junk email. We will notify you via email, again, if additional information is needed. And most importantly, we will notify you when your financial aid package is ready. If at any point you have any questions or concerns, please feel free to reach out. We are always here to help. Your next step, of course, if you decide to attend our university is you'll want to deposit and this can be done at any time. So please make sure that you reach out um, to either your admissions counselor or you can make the deposit online through our um, make a payment online um, or you can do it through your application status page. You will also want to complete any loan requirements if you decide that you will be taking out student loans. These things include entrance counseling, master promissory notes, um, maybe additional loan information um, that is needed, maybe for a parent loan. Um, and then also other departments will be reaching out to you as well. So again, this is where checking your student email is gonna come in and it's gonna be so important. So our orientation team will send you out information regarding the orientation. Health services will reach out um, for health related um, things that they need. Um, our business office will be reaching out regarding payment plans. And of course, advising will be reaching out regarding how to enroll in your classes, which I know a lot of students want to do as, as soon as possible. So again, check your email. It is going to be the most important thing that you can do. All right. So I know that I've covered a lot and it's been 40 plus minutes. Um, but I just want to say again, thank you so much for spending um, some time with me today. I really hope that this webinar was beneficial for you. Um, I hope that I have ho hopefully eased some stress that you may be having and hopefully are not so overwhelmed with completing this FAFSA process. If at any time you have questions for us, please feel free to reach out. I've given you our contact information there on the screen. So please feel free to reach out if you have any questions or concerns. We are happy to help and we would love to help. So um, thank you so much for joining me and I hope you guys have a great night.